Thank you so much. I'm so happy to be here. Um, I'm happy to be here at the first GitConf conference. Um, this is really amazing. Um, like was mentioned, um, I'm Camille. I have, uh, I'm currently getting my degree in mechanical engineering. I work as a robotics engineer doing my day job. I like to sit at the intersection of hardware and software. And one of the reasons why I want to mention that is I think it's this conversation, we're going to talk about integration of societies, right? The idea of what do you do? What kind of conversations do you have when you have an idea or a person not previously represented in the conversation? Um, and what, how do you bring those together? So in my work, I set up the intersection of hardware and software, like I mentioned, I work on robotics. So a lot of times I'm talking to teams that maybe developed hardware in one space, software in another space, and so we're bringing them together. And so I think this is going to come through in the talk. You know, I kind of talk like a mechanical engineer, but hopefully you'll enjoy it. Um, and let's get to it. So one of the reasons why I'm here on this stage right now is I really do believe that we must ensure that the world that we live in today, the world that we experience today, with all the isms, the racism, the sexism, all the phobias, the transphobia, the xenophobia, that that world is not the world that artificial intelligence interprets for us tomorrow. And so that's really important because we are today living in a world where we make decisions based off of algorithms. That's not something in the future, that's something that we do currently today. And we're gonna get into that a little bit. So, in the, in the world of AI, we have this new discipline called explainable AI or fairness in AI, and that's talking about looking at those ideas of are we using biased AI, are we having unwanted bias, and um, we have come up with an acronym. Um, it's called FAT, or FAT, and it stands for fairness. So the idea that you could have a data set that is skewed towards one um, discipline or, or one community. So for example, if you have an image recognition software and it can't reasonably detect a bunch of different skin tones, you might have a fairness problem in your data set. And next is accountability. Who's responsible for making changes? Who's responsible for keeping up the code, making sure that it reflects the values and the systems that we live in our society? And then next is transparency. Uh, are we transparent about how those systems are in place, what they use, um, what data sets they use, what kind of information they use, and do we have control over those ideas? That idea of a black box in AI, right? Do we, can we look inside that black box? Now that's how the world of expandable AI and fairness in AI and our uh, current experts kind of look at it. I like to add one more thing to that though, and that's responsibility. So my acronym is FRAT. <laughs> And that is fairness, of course, yes, but also responsibility. When you drop something, whether it's in production or pre-production, you should be part of the solution. We all have blind spots, and blind spots doesn't just mean, oh, I didn't realize that someone um, had an experience I didn't know, but it's also, hey, I also have to take responsibility for the fact that I'm not gonna be able to design for every case, I'm not gonna see every accessibility issue, I'm just not gonna know. And so that idea of responsibility as well, not just to push something out and uh, say, well, there it goes, but also to be part of that solution. So next, I wanna go over a few examples um, of how we've been using AI, how we've seen it fail. Um, some of these might be familiar to you, which is great, and some of them might not be. And so I just want to go through that basic example of why it's important, what we're seeing, and, uh, and kind of where we're on in this journey. So the first example I'm going to give is of a pretty technical example of a machine learning training set. So how many know what machine learning training sets are? I just want to... Okay, cool. I will explain this. So, a machine learning training set is what we use to help make our algorithms make decisions. Um, one of the things that I think is important to realize about AI and systems is it's not just code that's working in the background, it's code that's making decisions. So it's taking in information and then making a decision with that. And it's really important that we understand how it's making those decisions because we, and I'm gonna to get to some examples here in a second, we actually make policy decisions about how we live our lives, how we talk to each other and work with each other based off of algorithms. A really good example, if you're still having trouble connecting with this idea, is Facebook. Our Facebook feeds give us information, we internalize that information, and we make actions off of that. That's an algorithm where you're actually interacting with it and making decisions based off of it. So we're gonna get into some more examples. But for right here, this is, a, this is an example of a machine learning training set. 
And my point is gonna be that relationships that are common in our everyday language, how we talk to each other, what we write about each other in news articles, is appearing in these machine learning translations. So we're to vec. That's a technical word, but where to vec is a, the name of a machine learning training model that Google uh, developed based off of Google News Stories. And what they wanted to do was provide vector relationships between words and associations. So that way an algorithm could predict what, what, what you're searching and understand what you're searching and provide context. So when Microsoft went and, and uh, they did a study on this machine learning model and they found some relationships when they asked it certain questions. So first question, or the first question that they asked it was, okay, machine learning training model, can you answer us this? Father is a doctor as mother is too. And it came up with the answer, nurse. And then they asked, okay, uh, what about this? Man is to compute a programmer as woman is to what? And it said homemaker. So this obviously is an implicit sexist bias. Um, and this word, this machine learning training model is used to train other um, types of search algorithms or other things that you might um, be using today. Uh, maybe you don't know that you're using it, but it's there. And this is also, again, about the decision-making process that it's making, that it's, excuse me, using. So let's go to the next example. So this example is for policing. So a whole other example, whole other um, subject matter. And this is why it's really important to start thinking about this, because AI is it's far and vast ranging. So there are multiple examples of police using facial recognition as a law enforcement tool with no regulations or checks for bias and needs use. So this map on the right is showing you all the places where there are police communities using AI um, to help with their police enforcement tools. They're specifically using facial recognition. So that could be facial recognition using driver's license, mug shots, or some other limited data. Now the problem with this is that there's blatant misuse or um, also just not enough auditing systems to make sure that uh, it's not being misused or used to violate your rights. Um, and what this study found, the perpetual lineup, I encourage you to take a picture, go to this page later. The perpetual lineup showed that one out of every two Americans is in some type of database. And out of that, those Americans that are in this, these databases, they're mostly law-abiding citizens. And in this context, I mean people with no arrest records. And so what that also demonstrates is you could be attributed to guilt or to have some type of uh, reason for um, some type of search or some type of violation of your rights based solely on being in one of these databases. So being that we're in Nebraska, and you can kind of see there's a dot right there for Nebraska, I thought we'd look at some of the results that they found for Nebraska itself. And I'm sorry, it's a little hard to read. I put this together last night. <laughs> but this is a scorecard, and Nebraska is here on the second to the bottom. This is a scorecard of how well um, the, whatever uh, entity, which is the Nebraska State Patrol, there's only one patrol that they listed, or one entity that they listed for Nebraska, um, how well they're using this material. And this is gonna demonstrate like the impact. What is the impact of having a policing system like this um, work for you or against you? So um, it's ranked in columns here. There's about seven columns. The first one is people in the database, and that's referring to how, what information are they using, and is it regulated, is it protected? The next column is about real-time use. Are they using real-time data? Um, that can provide you extra risk in like, if they're trying to go out and search for somebody, and it's like, everybody get out there and search. Like Real-time use is where you could be at great risk for that type of thing. Fourth amendment rights is the third column. The fourth column is free speech. The fifth column is accuracy. Um, the sixth column is transparency. And the seventh column is audits. So um, let's go through the rankings for Nebraska. So Nebraska um, uses driver's license photos to help in their policing tool. And the reason why this is red is because it's kind of hard to look at just driver's license 
uh, images and have context. So what they could have done was help scrub some of that information, make sure that if you ha are, you've never been arrested, that that shows, provides context. Otherwise, again, you're just in the system and there's no context, you're just there. Real-time use, this is marked yellow. Because they have no policy addressing the use of facial recognition um, using real-time data, but uh, they're not able to, uh, let's see, the agency hasn't affirmatively stated that it does not use facial recognition in this ma manner, excuse me. So um, there's some unknowing. Where Nebraska seems to do, where the Nebraska State Patrol seems to do really well is in the first, Fourth Amendment rights. These blue check marks, I know it's really hard to read, but these blue check marks kind of state all about the Fourth Amendment, that there seems to be protections for the Fourth Amendment, that you're not gonna be um, subject to a search based on your whole life, like overturning every rock, but mostly just, um, it's around criminal activity. So the next two columns for free speech and accuracy are grayed out. Um, this study, I'm gonna go right back to it real quick, the perpetual lineup. They based this whole study, it's a year-long study, on about 1,500 documents and numerous requests to different police um, communities across the nation, but they weren't able to find out everything, and so they mentioned that in their study. Um, very robust study, lots of different examples, also really good visuals. Totally suggest you take a look at it. Um, and then in the next one is transparency. Um, that's the next column that has a, a block in it and it's red. And so this is really important. This is an important idea. The agency has not made its use pub policy public or it has no use policy. So one of the, I think, the big takeaways from this study and from the idea of policing with AI is if it's an invisible system, you don't know how your data is being used. You can be pulled over and they say this and this and this, this is why you need to come with us, but you have no real insight into how they got that information, what information they're using, how to correct it if it's wrong. You, you can't look into it, it's a black box of sorts. So that's where transparency is really key in some of these AI algorithms or AI uh, tools. Um, and then the last one, audits. Audit procedure is in place, but it's unclear if audits are conducted. So um, how do we make sure that misuse isn't happening, how do we make sure that we can mitigate bias? Those are the types of things that audits can help with, and that's again, it goes along right in key with transparency. So that's a big example um, of how it might be affecting you here in Nebraska. All right, my next example, I got two more. So this next example is Tay AI. How many have heard of Tay AI? Okay, just a couple, I will explain it. Microsoft released a chat bot in 2016, so way back when chatbots were kind of new to us, and they released it on Twitter. And this chatbot was supposed to emulate the personality of a young teenager who didn't really care a lot, wanted to make you know, statements that were just very down to earth and, and not, um, you know, not buffed by <laughs> being polite. And so what they found was that Tay, um, was an algorithm that they released, but that it could take in suggestions and it would repeat those suggestions, reflect those suggested ideas back. So this again is about algorithms interpreting our world for us and projecting what it believes our ideals are. And um, what happened was during the course of the day when it was released, some trolls got, in, got onto Twitter and started tweeting it different messages, xenophobia, hate messages, you know, things that we obviously do not take to um, in, our, in our greater society. And it started actually repeating and reflecting those messages back. And so they shut that down within a matter of hours. Um, it was shut down and brought back. Um, apologies were made. But this is, again, another example of how you know, we are suggesting how an AI should interpret our world based on the data of today. So the last example I want to show to you, it's pretty dark, um, but I think it's really important. Um, it's, I think it's the extreme case. If you didn't think the policing example was really bad, this will definitely knock your socks off. Um, project Norman was a project created by MIT to simulate the responses of a virtual psychopath. And so what they did was they took two different algorithms, and these are image recognition algorithms. So the idea is uh, it's a really popular tool or way to use machine learning, and that is, hey, let's have an algorithm that can caption images automatically. So algorithm, here's an image, can you caption it for us? 
So in this study, they took two different algorithms. They exposed one of them to a subreddit. And this particular subreddit uh, deals with images and ideas of really grotesque and um, extreme cases of um, human death. Uh, so they have images and videos, and I'm not going to show any, so no triggers here. But uh, it's about that idea of like um, just really gruesome deaths that happen. And so they exposed uh, Norman to this to these um, ideas, and then they kept the other algorithm separate. And then they gave them ink blot tests. So this is an idea like, okay, you have all this information, let's give you ink blot tests, you know, very normal, just like you might see in another doctor's office. And what happened was, while the normal algorithm would say things like, oh, this is obviously a depiction of a flower, or two birds sitting on a tree, Norman would say, oh, this is someone being electrocuted or this is someone um, being dragged or something like that. So very different responses to the same information, to the same stimuli. That's pretty gross, right? <laughs> All right, so my point is that the way we use algorithms can have consequences for our personal knowledge, our collective personal knowledge. And this is and this is really important because we are using algorithms, again, not just to make decisions, but the algorithms are making decisions and interpreting our world for us. So I want to really quickly diverge just a little bit and talk about filter bubbles and blind spots. Because as we, we as engineers, we as um, designers, we as people who interact with products, we all have blind spots, we all have filter bubbles. And that's kind of where we have to think about the people who are experiencing our products, working with our products, what are they experiencing? What do they see? And so I'm going to highlight a really good TED talk in a book by Eli Prezer, who suggests the idea that in these filter bubbles, what if we were given the opportunity to have levers? Levers are ideas of how to change, um, change our experience. So for example, let's go back to that Facebook. Um, example that I mentioned earlier. If you're on your feed and you're seeing examples or content, um, do you want to understand where that content is coming from? And also, could you push up on a lever and say, hey, please give me more content that's outside my worldview, or please give me more content that's locally based, and understanding where those come from, and then busting those filter bubbles as you see fit, or at least having some degree of education about how big your filter bubble is. Another point I want to make is about over 50% of the world is online today. And that means there's a large pop percentage of the population that is not online. And we're creating products you know, that are better, they are more informed, they help us go through the world better. Maybe we raise our hand once in a while and say, hey, this algorithm doesn't work for me. Like, you got to get it fixed now. But there's a whole um, major population of the world that isn't online and not providing feedback. So what happens? When they do get online, they're interacting with our products and they weren't made for them at all. How do they experience the world? How are they misrepresented or invisible to us even? So that's why it's really important to start thinking about and talking about these filter bubbles and blind spots now. Um, again, really great TED Talk by Eli. I would totally suggest that you check it out. All right, so before I go on to my next section of my talk, um, where I'm going to describe some solutions that we've seen, some ways that you can get involved today. Uh, I want to talk about what I'm not saying. So all bias is not bad. It's the unwanted bias that we want to get rid of. We want to get rid of the racism, the isms, the phobias, and we, that's what we want to prevent. We, do, we use stereotypes every day to understand our world and to be able to move about our world in a quick fashion and an orderly fashion. So we do need some bias, but we want to get rid of the unwanted bias from our products. All right, this is a big topic, and maybe it's presumed that it's super messy and you need an expert, but I'm going to go through some examples of where it's not just for the technical representatives, not just for the machine learning um, experts. It is uh, something that we can do, all of us together. You just need a little intention and some ideation. I think we're all good at that in this room. So. Next part of my talk, how do we make it better? I don't think we can fix it. I don't think we live in a perfect world. I mentioned our blind spots. We probably haven't seen every example of an accessibility issue. We haven't seen every example of any of the issues that we come into contact every day. So it's about making it better and making it more productive. 
Another thing that we often talk about, I mean, we're here at a conference that is a, to be an ally to all communities. We all talk a lot about creating more developers, having more developers, a bigger community of technologists that are diverse and represent everyone. But we also need to make sure we have users that represent everyone. I talked a little bit about how the world is coming, more of the world is coming online, and we're seeing, um, we're gonna see more problems with the way that we develop technology today for those people. So it's also about making sure that we have a broad user base. All right, so I wanna, uh, I mentioned Lever a little bit ago. I just wanna make sure that um, we all understand when I say Lever, I'm talking about the opportunity to make a different choice and create a more positive experience. And that's gonna become um, a little bit more clear as we go through some of these examples. But I think that's really important. It crosses a lot of different disciplines, not just this one, not just AI, but um, a lot of different disciplines. All right, so let's get in the weeds a little bit. I'm gonna get a little technical right here. I think this is the most technical slide I have. Um, but this idea, we, I mentioned before, the idea of the lever, right, where you're taking, maybe you want to ask Facebook, hey, can I see something that um, is outside my worldview? That idea is called partial dependence. It's the idea of, can I see what um, one uh, feature, how, if I change one feature, what that looks like and how that changes my model, how that changes my perception of the world. And so this is an example of Titanic data on survival rate. And, um, this is just an example of a feature. So we all know the story of the Titanic, right? How it went down. This one's looking at the survival rate based on age and based on fare. So you can see the younger you are, the more likely you are to survive the Titanic. And the more expensive your fare was, the more likely you were likely to survive the Titanic. So it's the idea of understanding your world, your perception of the world, not just is this a whole body of survival, survivors from Titanic, but also like what were those different um, prescriptors or features. Okay, let's go to the next example. So we talked about transparency, and that's really key. And this uh, data sheets for data sets is a really good example of transparency, writing transparency in. It's also another good example of non-technical use for creating fairness in AI. So Tim Gibru is a really amazing researcher. She developed this idea with her team. And this is an idea that when you create a data set or when you go to use a data set, do you understand how it's been used, what it was used for, uh, and what you can do with it? So here, she asks key questions. And again, I think this can go past just AI. This goes for any type of technology you're creating, this idea of understanding why it was created. So let's go through some of the questions on the data sheet. This is just a sample. Um, you can always uh, Google data sheets for data sets to check that out. So why was this data set created? And what tax could the data set be used for? Now, the other question you can ask is, what tax should it not be used for? Correct? So the idea that you're creating and writing and encoding an intention behind your technology. Whatever technology you're creating, there's an intention behind it, and it's stated what its use is for. Has the data set been used for any task recently? So the idea of what's its portfolio? Have I seen any of its recent work? Maybe I have, and that would be nice to see. And then if the data sets relates to people or was generated by people, were they informed? about the data collection. So going back to that policing example, was I informed that my information is in that data, in the policing system and in the policing Im image recognition system, or facial recognition system? So the idea of informed consent, again, right? Uh, how is my data being used? What is it being used for? And where is it going? All right, I hope that makes sense. All right, so um, before I go on to my next example, I like to put up this slide because I started talking about fairness in AI, explainable AI, a couple years ago. And when I was talking about it, there was no out-of-the-box solutions. Um, there was no one there to say, oh, this is what you should use, plug it into your data set, plug it into your algorithm, and you can learn more about how to make it more fair. Uh, this was the slide I would use in my talk to get started, to help people understand what I was visualizing, maybe what I was using as an internal tool, but wasn't an external tool that I could talk about. Um, so we're gonna go through this example just in case um, it might make some things more clear about what we're talking about here and the technology that we can use. 
So say you have a speed limit sign and you have an image recognition software or AI algorithm that's supposed to detect speed signs. Um, and it breaks it up into different parts to understand whether or not it's a speed sign. So this might be the really bold border, the font, the number five, the word speed. It might use those things to just say, hey, yes, this is maybe a speed limit sign or maybe it's not a speed limit sign. And then you ascribe an accuracy to that based on how many times it got it right. So explainable AI is the middle two columns. So first column being the speed limit sign, second column being, oh, these are the things that I used to determine whether it was a speed limit sign. Third column being, yes, this is a speed limit sign, no, it's not. And those two middle columns are what we want to know and understand more. We want to understand why an algorithm made the decision that it made. And that's explainable AI, as I understand it, and I think it's a great example just of where you can go with this. Again, I think this goes way past just AI, but to a lot of different technology and understanding why, it makes, why they make the decisions that they make. So I'm gonna get to these two really great out-of-the-box solutions um, that help us understand our AI, their visualization tools. So what's really great about visualization tools is that it doesn't need to work just for the machine learning scientist who's working on their features, making sure that, it's, um, that they're mitigating bias, but this also works for a non-technical expert, the marketing person, um, the people who are also need to understand the basis for the technology that they're promoting, creating, or being a part of in any way. So let's start with the what if tool. And I'm gonna go through this a little slowly. So this is um, a demo, and this, you can go to this website up top to access a demo yourself. You can look at different data sets um, and try to play around the levers. Um, and this shows the classifiers for predicting salary over 50K from the US Census. So the idea is, the people in the blue have less than 50K. The people on the red dots have greater than 50K. And we're gonna go back to that partial dependence example I showed you earlier, where you're looking at the specific features and trying to understand the data better. So the categories for partial dependence in this tool is age, hours worked per week, capital gain, capital loss, and years of education. So on the left, the, the left, graph, um, we're looking at hours worked per week, and on the right graph, we're looking at age. And you can imagine if you uploaded a data set of your own, um, how maybe by one feature you could have blue mixed with red, you could have more in the bottom, or red in the bottom, or red in the top, and this is an idea of what does it look like when you look at the features and how they influence your data. Let's go to the next one by IBM. It's called the AI Fairness 360 tool. Again, you can look at that link at the top to go to the actual demo. Similar example to um, the what if tool, you import your data. And then here you have four different algorithms that you can use to mitigate bias. Reweighing is um, similar to this previous example on the what if tool where you're looking at the partial dependence. Optimized processing is about pre-scrubbing your data, making sure that it doesn't have bias before you start. And then there's a couple of other algorithms that you can also use. On the right, I know it's really hard to read, I'm sorry. <laughs> on the right, you can also ask me later, I can show it, this to you on my laptop, where it's a lot clearer. I can also play with the live demo, if you would like to. Um, but they have two different um, bars. One is for the original data, and then the, the bluish color is for what happens when it's mitigated, when the bias is mitigated. Now, one of the things that happens when you mitigate bias is that sometimes your algorithm is less accurate. Whereas you got 90% accuracy before, uh, now it went down to 86%. So it's important to keep that in mind, that you're gonna be looking for either improved or not so improved results from your algorithm. If you are using uh, image recognition software today, uh, or facial recognition software today, and you are having the same problem with the idea of, hey, I don't have a diverse data set, I don't know what to do. IBM also has a really great data set um, for diversity in faces. Very large, very expansive. I think they're really helping change the game here. So I thought I'd throw this up here in case anyone's actually working with um, or needed more diverse data sets in images, um, especially faces. 
Now the last part I want to do is highlight some amazing, especially amazing women of color that have been working in this space for a long time because you know we are the best narrators of our experience and they've been working on this for a long time. So the first one I want to mention is Joy Blaumini. She's an amazing researcher at the MIT Media Lab. At the MIT Media Lab. Um, and she's a poet, which is amazing. And her story is she was working on a social robot, you know, one of those robots that interact with you. And you're like, hello, who are you? And uh, it was using facial recognition software to help detect you know, the people it was interacting with. And not surprisingly, she wasn't able to be detected by her own project. And so in order to finish her project, she actually had to wear a white mask. And she talks about her story and how she went through that and actually went to MIT to study more about that. She just finished up at MIT. I totally suggest that you, um, if you can, get a hold of her paper and read it. But the other thing that she does, and it's really amazing, I think of Joy as a first. She comes out with these things first. In fact, when I first started talking about this, she was one of the first uh, researchers I could, I mean, she was the only researcher I could actually refer to as being working in this specific area of culture bias or bias in AI in this way. Um, but her website is ajlunited.org. So ajlunited.org. And on her website, she also talks about things like policing and using AI in policing. But another thing she does really well is if you feel like you've experienced some type of bias or you see something that you want to report, she actually has a place on your, her website for you to go and log that and say, hey, this is something I experienced or something I've noticed. Can you go check it out? And I think that's important. Again, one of the first I've seen in the idea of, hey, we have all these algorithms out here. Who's responsible for looking at this and mitigating the bias across our world? Next, if you need books to understand more about either blind spots, algorithm in general, um, technology in general, and how it's used, uh, you could gift these, you could read them and then gift them. They're amazing. Sophia Noble is an amazing author. She wrote Algorithms of Oppression. This retooled my idea of how Google search is used. Um, so I totally suggest that you check that out. Looking at algorithms, she also has some really good um, anecdotal evidence. Uh, weapons of math destruction. How many have read Weapons of Math Destruction? Anybody? OK. Well, it's a really great book. Um, very, uh, again, both of these are very easy to read and really good gifts, too, for anybody who's thinking about, hey, I haven't really had any of my blind spots or filter bubbles poked in a while. Um, these are really great to start on that conversation. Weapons of Math Destruction by Kathy O'Neill. Um, I totally suggest that you check them out. Um, so again, I want to end with this, this idea of frat. Fairness, it's really important to understand your data sets, to understand your technology, what it's using, why it's using it, what conclusions it's coming to, because we are living in a world where AI is making decisions for us, or we're interpreting our own world or making decisions of our, for our world based off the decisions that AI has already done for us. So it's important to interrupt that cycle, make sure we understand where that information is coming from, responsibility, um, as technologists, as engineers, as creators, as people who work on products. Um, it's our responsibility to understand what kind of influence we're putting out into the world. Accountability, who's going to actually pick this up you know, and make it better? Transparency as well, not just in understanding what the decisions are, what decisions the AI is making, like in that policing example, where is that content coming from, how is my data being used, but also providing levers for our communities, um, our audience, our uh, consumers, um, our customers to be able to change and make um, their experience better. Um, I'm just going to put this up for a second um, because I think it's important to also talk about pipelines. This is something that you're like, oh my god, I really want to work in this right now. Uh, how do I do this? Um, please feel free to take a picture. There's a couple of um, people who are hiring in this area and in this field. Um, there's a couple of papers out there that you can read, um, and they're tackling all kinds of different um, subjects. One thing I want to highlight, though, is the key term line. There's one right there and then one at the bottom. I also made this last night, so it's not very clear. But the key term is because this is a new discipline, a new field. Um, I think every company kind of has their own way to describe it. So for example, IBM says trustworthy machine learning and AI, whereas Google says responsible AI or machine learning fairness. So if you want to research this later, um, it's important to know that everybody kind of has their own name for it. All right, thank you.